So Luke chapter 4. I love, love this verse. Uh, um, Jesus gets opportunity in the synagogue to read from the scriptures, and they hand him uh, the scroll in the passage of Isaiah. And, uh, you know, it is God ordained circumstances here that he has this scroll and unrolls to this passage of, and begins to read, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, a recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I love that verse all on its own. I love that verse connected to uh, the day of Pentecost, which is, I know our series says the day of Pentecost. And today's not the day of Pentecost. It's coming up uh, in a couple of weeks. And we are getting ready for it. And we're talking about this person of the Holy Spirit. And we're talking about how Jesus wants to fill our lives to overflowing with his presence by the person of the Holy Spirit. And because we need the Holy Spirit of the living God to flood our lives. And, and we'll talk about why we need him in us. Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven. Filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of the Lord enabled them. So on May 19th, we will celebrate the day of Pentecost together. And uh, I'm going to give you a short version. We talked about what the day of Pentecost was last Sunday. And so we're going to do the, I wouldn't say the Reader's Digest version of that, but then I just sound old because no one knows what the Reader's Digest is anymore. Uh, um, the short version, Day of Pentecost, right? The Day of Pentecost was instituted by the Jewish people during the lifetime of Moses, right? The first Feast of Pentecost was celebrated 50 days after the first Passover, hence the word Pentecost, 50. Uh, Pentecost always falls 50 days after Passover. Pentecost was instituted by God as a celebration of the inbringing of the harvest, the, the beginning and the end of the physical harvest of, of wheat and grain for the Jewish people. Uh, it just so happens that our Father in Heaven also chose, right, not a coincidence, the first day of Pentecost after Jesus' resurrection to send the Holy Spirit uh, of the living God to come and fill the church uh, because the church needs the power of God to fulfill the Great Commission, to go into all the world and to preach this gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything he's commanded us. Amen. We want to be disciples of Jesus. It's more than raising your hand. It's more than coming up front to, and it's more than repeating a prayer. Jesus didn't call us uh, to simply get people to the point of conversion. Jesus called us to become mature followers, disciples of him. Tradition holds that Moses was given the Ten Commandments on the day of Pentecost. He went up the mountain to meet with God, and he came down the mountain with the word of God. Similarly. Jesus ascended into heaven to meet with his Father in heaven, and on the day of Pentecost, uh, the promised Holy Spirit descended on the earth. On Pentecost, the followers of Moses celebrate the natural harvest of food grown in the soil, but followers of Jesus celebrate the supernatural harvest of souls given by the Holy Spirit. Jesus sent us the promised Holy Spirit to, with a purpose in mind, and it wasn't so we could make new denominations uh, out of the church. Right? The, Jesus didn't send us the Holy Spirit so the Assemblies of God could be born, although we were born out of that movement, and there were several other 
hundreds of uh, denominations born from the modern day outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the Zulu Street in 1906. Uh, but that's not why Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. Uh, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and then you will take this gospel and you'll share it with people who are hurting and lost and broken and bound and addicted and living in the darkness, and you will be the light that shining in the world, uh, showing them the way. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And I, I wrote Luke chapter 4. I want you to pray for me. For we've been, we'll be here six years in July. And I've never been a big, like, have a, like a, not, not that I don't have a vision. I do have a vision, but I don't have like a sentence, right? You don't see a sentence on the wall. This is our mission statement. I struggle with that um, in ministry. I feel like the Holy Spirit is leading me and our congregation to work on this Luke chapter 4 and adopt it as our mission statement. The, the Spirit of the Lord is on us. The church has good news. I think the church needs to work on that message. <laughs> uh, I don't know how many of you associate, you, you think of church, immediately you think, oh, I'm going to go to church, good news. I don't think most people associate that with going to church. I think most people associate with, oh, well, I better go to church, I want to be a good person. <laughs> and I'm going to go to church and that man up there is going to beat the fire out of me. It's going to make me feel bad about myself. It's going to make me feel guilty about my life. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Hell. Hell is real, by the way. <laughs> but um, you got know, to talk about that a little bit, too. Good news, though. Jesus, the spirit of the sovereign Lord was on him. He was anointed to preach good news, and that's what he did. And it is amazing what you see when Jesus ministered. The people liked Jesus. People didn't like the Pharisees and Sadducees. And there was a reason that the people didn't like them, and there's a reason that people don't like church now. Jesus said, woe is unto you, the scribes and Pharisees, if you put a heavy burden on the people. You come up with all these rules they have to follow and everything they have to do to be right with God. And you won't even lift a little ounce of it with your finger to help them carry the load. You put the burden on them, but then you won't help them carry the load. He said, you guys are lost. We don't want to be the Pharisees and Sadducees. We want to be Jesus. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on us he has anointed us to preach good news to the poor. And the, the way that we become a light shining out of darkness is the Spirit of God filling us, firing us, sending us, and empowering us to share the news. Let's pray about the Holy Spirit. Let's pray about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Let's pray that, that people are filled, our young people are filled, and then we'll get into this this morning. Lord, thank you this morning that we can be in this place. Uh, in your word, uh, I pray, Holy Spirit, here we are talking about you. Come right now and do for everyone in this room what I cannot do for them with all of my blabbering. Lord, come to this place. Uh, open our hearts, our ears, our eyes, Lord, and come into this place uh, Lord, there are young people that are coming to the altar, and there are some of us that have been around for a little while that are coming to the altar, and we are saying that we want to, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit for the first time. We want to be refilled uh, with fresh fire, and I pray that you would do that, uh, because I can't make that happen on my own, but we know that it is the gift that the Father promised, and it is for every single person in this room that wants him, I pray May that happen in your time, and I just pray we don't.
have a bunch of pressure to make something happen, or whether it's you who make it happen. Pray for that in Jesus' name, amen and amen. So we are going to kick this thing off. I told you guys uh, that I need help, and you know that I do. So uh, I recruited my wife, who we've been talking about. Uh, some of our folks that received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I just asked them to share uh, their experience, what happened, what led up to it. And so I want to come and share her experience. shy and I thought 
if I can get extra boldness with this Holy Spirit, like, I need that. Like, I wanted to share the love of Jesus, but I was really shy. Um, so when, when I would go up for prayer, when I would pray in my own time, like, I felt the, the Lord, I felt the Holy Spirit. I would hear words come to my mind, but um, I did not want to offend the Holy Spirit. I did not want to offend the Lord. I didn't want to make up those words. And so I did not say them out loud because I was afraid I was going to just ruin everything and make um, the Lord upset with me. Um, so, but then like when I did, I had gotten to the point where I just, I didn't care anymore. I just wanted him. I wanted the Holy Spirit and I just took that leap of faith. So I encourage you, um, if you are seeking the Holy Spirit, if you're wanting to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and you hear those words in your mind, just speak them out. The Lord knows your heart. He knows, like, you don't want to offend him. You don't want to um, make it up. You want, and like, he, that's him. That's that's the Holy Spirit. And so I just encourage you to take that leap of step, uh, that step of faith, and just, Speak those out, and he will, he will fill you. Amen. Amen. I want my wife to share that testimony because one, she didn't grow up in church. Two, like I, I started going to Pentecost, Pentecostal church when I was a little kid, like little little kid, and I was around my grandma and my family were all. Should have bought a Hyundai, untie a bow tie, like all the time. <laughs> I, I up, like I was around that every single weekend, week out. They come to our house for prayer meetings. I never thought that was weird. I, I never even knew that was weird and, until I met people that was like, "That's weird." I was like, "Oh, it's weird. What's weird about it?" Like, well, what are you doing? <laughs> but you know, uh, so I was like, "Oh, well, yeah. I guess I could see from your perspective how that could be weird." But it was never weird for me. And then I also want to share because, like, I got saved when I was 19 years old. I got saved in June 1st, 1993. And I started seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit because I was just on fire for God and I love Jesus. And I got filled in August of that same year, just a couple months later. My wife got saved when she was 11, and she didn't speak in other tongues until she was 15. So I don't want to discourage uh, people that are here that want to, you know, receive the gift, uh, but at the same time, I also don't want to be discouraged that oh, I've gone up to the altar and it's not happening. And I would also just say this. I think some people are filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit before they have their kind of public experience of it. I've talked with some of the young people and shared my own experience that like I got saved and I loved Jesus and I wanted all of him that I could get and I would be at home and I'd be praying in my little room there I lived with my grandma over here on 327 and I'd be praying and then I'd say oh Chandamakai and then i like oh no that's not God that's the, you know that's the devil and don't say that you're like just like my wife like don't don't say those words because you're just making them up uh, um so I think some of us are filled with the Holy Spirit. We just need that kind of extra step. So don't be discouraged. It is, it's going to happen. Right? He, he made the promises. That, so we're going to pray for people at the end of the service. If you want to come for prayer. If you don't want to come for prayer, that's perfectly fine too. Uh, you can, I encourage you during worship service, you know, um, just to pray and worship and at some point over the next couple of weeks, uh, stop praying in your natural English language and just start praying out loud in your heavenly language. Uh, I know that it seems harder than that and I know that some of you have really struggled because um, I've talked with some and we might have a, a, a friend of mine share his testimony of his struggle for some people that have been through that. So, 
Thank you, Derek, for sharing your testimony. Um, let's get into this. So our natural world needs his supernatural power. The psalmist said this, Psalm 73. I'm always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into your glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is my strength, that, the strength of my heart and my portion forever. This is a very convicting scripture for me to talk about because I wish that I could say it was it is true for me, but it is not. To, because the psalmist said, Earth has nothing I desire besides you. I can say, that is my prayer. I am praying that Jesus help me, save me from my passions that I have for the things of this world because I do have those. Uh, but what the psalmist prayed, that is what I want. And I believe for most of the people in this room um, that you feel the same way. And someone might say, you know, well, well, I desire God. Which I, my answer to that is, well, I desire God also. But the psalmist didn't say, right, he didn't say, I desire God. Uh, what he said was that on the earth, there is nothing he desired besides God. And that God, and only God, was his portion of forever. So the problem that I am having, and I think it is a problem that a lot of American Christians struggle with, is that along with our desire for God, we also desire 1,000 other things. We desire God, and we desire wealth. We desire God, and we desire material things. We desire God and we desire the American dream. The American dream has been pounded into our heads since we were little kids. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, I won't comment on whether I think that's right or wrong right now. I don't know. Um, I know what the psalmist said. The only thing I desire on earth is God. I, I'm not saying we can't have those other things uh, because we, we can and we have to. I mean, they're necessities, right? You know, roof over our head, uh, family to share our life and love with, uh, our church family. There's things in life that are, you know, just they're part of life uh, that, that we need and we use them. I'm talking about, though, where is our hunger and thirst? And I, I know that we think, well, you know, it's just natural. Uh, it, it's just natural. Everyone wants stuff. Everyone wants to do stuff. Everyone wants to go places. Uh, and the thing is, it is natural. And that's what we have to be careful of. Because we aren't just natural. Everyone out there, they're natural. They live in the natural realm, and the natural is all they have, and there's nothing more than the natural for people that aren't living in relationship with Jesus. But what separates us from them is that we are living in a relationship with Jesus, and for us, life is not just natural. As a matter of fact, life is supposed to transform beyond natural and move into supernatural. But the world is held captivated by the natural, and we've lost our hunger and thirst for the supernatural. We have to be careful that our thirst for the natural does not replace our thirst for the supernatural. If we drink and drink it, at the fountain of the world, we will lose our thirst for the fountain of living water. I'm going to tell on myself, I like to be mean to me, because I don't like to be mean to you guys, even though I know you don't believe me and think that I do, because I've done some things accidentally. Um, 
Um, when I first got saved, I was 19 years old, and it may sound like an exaggeration. I could sit down at a table and I could read my Bible for four, five, six hours just because I wanted to, and I loved it. I was excited about it. That's that's how I wanted to spend my time. And then over the years, slowly, man, I'm struggling to read five or six chapters now. <laughs> you thought it would be the other way around. But I'll tell you what I can tell you what happened is that when the fire started dwindling down, I didn't keep stoking it and putting the wood on it. Because it takes work. Netflix doesn't take any work. Right? Max doesn't take any work. Instagram doesn't take any work. You just get on and you're coasting, right? Staying on fire for God requires investment and discipline. And if we aren't careful, the natural will end up consuming and we'll lose our hunger for the supernatural. First John says this. Do not love the world or anything in the world. Right? That's an atomic bomb just dropped on my lap right there. Don't love the world or anything in the world. American Christians, we love everything about the world. We are chasing just as hard after everything in the world that I know, I'm not saying it's true for 100% of us, but it's true for a lot of us in the American church that the only thing that differentiates us from them is that on Sundays we're, we're in here doing something and they're out there watching football or baseball or whatever's on. The rest of the week, though, you can't even differentiate the church from the world. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love for the Father is not in them. Everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. Whoever does the will of God lives forever. The natural is never going to quench the thirst that we have inside. Right? That which is of the earth will never quench our thirst because we are thirsty for that which is of heaven. You guys know I love the story of Jesus and the woman by the well. It's John chapter 4. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He, he is passing through Samaria and he stops at a little town there because he has a divine appointment uh, with a woman who has been struggling through life. She's been married and divorced five times. She's now living with a man that she's not married to. And Jesus says, I have to stop and have a meeting with this lady. Because why? Because the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. To this lady who is poor in spirit. Who now believes on man number six that there is absolutely no hope. She has been rejected by the people in her culture because the decision she has made. People didn't live like that back then, even though we do now. Nowadays, you probably wouldn't even know in the blink of an eye, right, if you've been on your husband number six. Uh, back then, it was a cultural no-no. <laughs> uh, she didn't have any bread. She was completely alone in the world, uh, except Jesus loved her and wanted to minister to her. So he sits down and begins a discussion with her, and he's talking about the living water. It, and he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst indeed. The water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. We want the water that Jesus has for us because the water that Jesus has for us is supernatural water. It's not natural. Okay, if I pour you a glass of water and you drink it, the water in the glass goes down. We, I think we'd all agree on that. After you drink some water, you have less water than when you started. That is how it works naturally. 
But Jesus, it doesn't work like that. When Jesus pours us a cup of water and we drink of water from Jesus, the water in the cup doesn't go down, the water in the cup goes up. After we drink the water that Jesus gives us, we have more water than when we started. That is supernatural, and that's what we want. It's the opposite of the world. I know I told you guys before about when I used to spend time drinking with my friends. And I think, I'll just go out one more time and black out one last time, and then I'll be done. The problem was, for those, that, and I'm sure a few of us know in here, that you don't want it less when you get done. You want it more. There's no one last time. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink it. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Holy Spirit to, who was about to come and fill them on the day of Pentecost. When we drink in the Holy Spirit, it's not like drinking in the world. You're not just thirstier and thirstier and thirstier. Instead, the Holy Spirit quenches your thirst. And, and when you drink, you don't run out of water. When you drink in the Holy Spirit, the water actually overflows out of you like a river, right? The earth has nothing I desire besides you. God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I believe that there are many people in this room that's what we want together, and that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in us this morning by filling us with his presence. If you want that, uh, then, as my friend T.D. Jakes used to preach it, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. You don't, don't remember T.D. Jakes? Check it out on YouTube, okay? Look him up. Can you get me one? Get like a big old towel. He was a big guy, not like me. Skinny little guy. start preaching and get really sweaty. Okay. <laughs> There's a purpose for the fullness of the Spirit. Every Christian needs the fullness of the Holy Spirit operating in their lives. And I'll just take one little detour. I try not to do too many detours. That's why I do notes because otherwise we'll be here all day listening to me with detours. Um, just so you understand, when you got saved, the Holy Spirit came to live inside of you. Okay? If you're in this room and you love Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you already. You can't even get saved unless the Holy Spirit came inside of you to make you to want to get saved, to regenerate you, uh, and draw you into Jesus because that didn't happen naturally. You didn't choose him. He chose you. Okay? So if you got saved, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. That's not what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about a little bit more than that. We're talking about a separate experience with the person of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, when all the apostles were there in the upper room with the other 120 minus 12. Hmm. I think one of those gifs where the numbers are like going up there. 108, thank you. The apostles were up there with 108 of the other people. <laughs> They were already saved, right? They were born again. They were following Jesus. And then Acts chapter 2 happened. We need our Acts chapter 2 in our own lives. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. It suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And it was the day of Pentecost, and all these thousands and thousands of people were there from all over the known world of that time, and the apostles began to speak 
and the 108 with them begin to speak it, and they begin to declare the wonders and the glories of God in the languages of the people that were there, and they said, we are hearing this good news in our own language. What in the world is going on around here? And then verse 13 is where some of us are. Uh, some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. They've been, they're hungover. They had too much to drink. So, so from the very first day of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, people have had a hard time understanding the role and the purpose of the Holy Spirit in our lives. There's a reason that, that Jesus told his friends to wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit. He told them to wait for the Holy Spirit because Jesus knew his friends would need the Holy Spirit to, to do the work that he called them to do. And he knows that we need the Holy Spirit right now to do the work that he's called us to do. Maybe you're here this morning and you have a hard time understanding. Why should I be seeking a more interactive and personal relationship with the Holy Spirit? And what is the purpose of that relationship? Why would I do that? If you are a follower of Jesus, then you need the promised Holy Spirit, not just for your own life, but you need it for your neighbors around you also. Because the Holy Spirit is going to help us uh, help some other people. That's what the Holy Spirit, among other things, that's what He does in us. He comes in, He fills us up, He gives us strength and power and boldness, and, and He helps us help people that are living in the darkness that we've been set free from. There are certain things in life that only God can do. So the, the answers to these questions are going to be pretty obvious. Do you know anyone right now that needs help? I bet you do, because I do. Uh, as a matter of fact, I could flip that around because I don't know anyone right now that doesn't need help. As a matter of fact, I know so many people that need help, there's no possible way I can help them all. Everyone I know needs help. And most of the people I know need help, more help than I can give them. Let me get a witness up in here. Do you know anyone? <laughs> do you know anyone that could use a thousand bucks right now? Amen. I don't know anyone that could not use a thousand bucks right now. Then you could go buy some groceries, right? Thank you. One trip to the grocery store. Right. Do you know anyone that needs a supernatural healing in their bodies? I know so many people that are dealing with so many things that the doctors have ever since my life started this journey like Four and a half years ago now, something like that. And since my wife has been going through this thing that the doctors can't figure out what it is, I met, we have met so many people that the doctors don't know what the heck's going on with them. Like, well, what am I paying for? Do you know anyone that desperately needs some unsaved loved ones to get saved? I do. We need the Holy Spirit because people's needs are beyond our abilities, but they're not beyond God's abilities. What we cannot possibly do on our own, God can do through us by the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. I'll give you an example from the first day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 3, and it's a long passage, so bear with me here. Uh, Acts chapter 3, on one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, 3 in the afternoon, there was a man crippled from birth who was being carried to the temple gate that they called it beautiful, where he was put every single day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and then Peter said to him, Look at us. And so the man looked at them, expecting to get a few coins to buy lunch. And then Peter said to him, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. 
rise and walk. And they took him by the right hand, they helped him up, and instantly his feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. He went with them to the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the same man who used to sit and beg at the temple gate beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished, and they came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. And when Peter saw this, he said to them, People of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus, his name and faith that comes through him that has given him this complete healing, as you can all see. And this part, verse 22, is very discouraging, right? Because, like, he is really old. He's over 40 years old. My old man. So... I think you probably remember um, what just happened to Peter and John in Acts chapter 2. If you don't remember, I'll refresh your memory. Acts chapter 2, Peter and John just received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What happened right after they received the baptism in the Holy Spirit is that Peter and John helped someone that they had absolutely no power to help. Why do you stare at us if, as if by our own power or godliness, we made this man off. We couldn't do this. We didn't have this power. We could have never done this on our own. It is the Spirit of God who has come and filled us uh, and has flowed through us uh, and touched this man that has changed his life. So this man was crippled from birth. Every day for 40 years, they took him and sat him down somewhere. At the temple gate, ironically, the temple gate called beautiful. And I think that that's ironic because there's absolutely nothing beautiful right, going on in this man's life. He was a beggar. He had no hope. There was nothing that anyone could do for him to change his life. There were no specialists for him to go see. Uh, there were no corrective surgeries that, that could be performed. He was born a cripple. He would live his entire life a cripple. And as far as he knew, he would die a crippled beggar. And there he is, seated at the temple gate called Beautiful, with nothing beautiful going on. We need the Holy Spirit to fill us to overflowing with God's presence and power because with man there are things that are impossible. But with God there is nothing that's impossible and with God all things become possible. We need the Holy Spirit because we walk by people all the time in this same man situation and for most of us I think it When's the last time you ever walked by someone and you thought to yourself, you know what, I'm going to do what Peter and John did for that guy. I'm just going to grab them and pray for them, and the Spirit of God is going to flow through me, and the Spirit of God is going to touch them, and they're going to jump up and be healed. I want to start thinking like that, right? I think the Holy Spirit wants us to think like that. Only God can take a situation as ugly as this beggar's and bring beauty to it. All of us know people in the same situation as this crippled beggar. We know people who metaphorically, they are sitting at the temple gate beautiful and there is nothing beautiful going on in their lives. We know people that need help uh, that only God can bring to them. We know people and their lives have been crippled by something. Maybe it's a sickness, uh, Maybe it's an addiction, maybe it's a tragedy they've experienced, or a deep emotional wound. 
Maybe it's a generational poverty that no matter how hard they try, no matter how much work they do, they just can't break out of the cycle. There are things that, that happen in life that are so ugly that we don't have the power to make them beautiful in us on our own without Jesus. That is why we need the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It, it is not only about uh, what he can do for us. It is also about what he can do through us for the people around us. The people around you need you to be full of Jesus. Uh, I just heard a pastor preaching this, and I've heard this example probably literally, seriously, 10,000 times in my life over the last 30 years. I'm sure you've heard it before, too. But this time it really hit me because I just had this experience a couple days ago. <laughs> he, he said, uh, he said uh, if you take an orange uh, and you squeeze it, uh, something's going to come out of it. Orange juice. No matter how many times you squeeze an orange, it's always going to be orange juice coming out. And there's never going to be apple juice or lemon juice coming out of an orange juice. And he said the reason that that's going to happen is because an orange is filled with orange. What happens when you squeeze Christians? Well, if you're here for the food giveaway, some people were squeezing me in line. And not literally. I mean, there's a lot to squeeze, but I mean. <laughs> Jesus was not coming out of me. <laughs> fisticuffs. You know what fisticuffs is? Is that a, something that this generation says? Google it. Fisticuffs. Are you one? Are you? I know you're one of those people like I am. Some of you are like I am. When I was younger, I used to be like, oh man. If I was ever persecuted for Jesus, I would just. If, if someone slapped me on the face, literally. I used to think I was like this. And I was on fire for God and young and dumb. I was like, I can't wait till someone slaps me in the face. I'm just going to love them. And I'm going to hug them. And I'm going to tell them Jesus loves them. When you squeeze an orange, orange juice comes out because it's filled with orange. When you squeeze a follower of Jesus, love is supposed to come out because we're filled with Jesus. But I noticed in the last couple of years when someone squeezing my life at the food giveaway or on the 160 there, love's not coming out. We need the person of the Holy Spirit because when when life squeezes a follower of Jesus, love should come out. I think about Jesus hanging on the cross and the people underneath him, mocking him, tempting him, and saying, if you're the son of God, come down from there and we'll believe in you. Man, I would have been, it would have been like, I don't know if you guys afford it. I mean, if that was me up there and they're down there saying, oh, come on down here. Let's see what you got. I would have come on down there. <laughs> <laughs> and they would have seen what I got. <laughs> Elijah called down bears from the mountains. It would have been like lightning and thunder and tornadoes. And <laughs> And I would have just did that thing on my hands and dust them off. Mm. Right? <laughs> Jesus was Jesus was on the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The fullness of the Holy Spirit isn't just about the kind of 
what some people, I mean, most of us in here know names, crazy names, all of us do. But the world thinks some of this stuff is crazy, right? Tongues and prophecies and crying and weeping and collapsing. The, the world thinks some of that stuff is weird. Maybe some people in here think that that's weird. That's not mainly what the Holy Spirit is about, even though those effects happen. The Holy Spirit is about making us so that when life squeezes us, the love of Jesus comes out of us. Because there are people in our lives, people surrounding us every day, and they're living broken, without hope, lost in a world full of darkness, and they don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. They have no hope for their future. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Freedom to the captives, deliverance to the oppressed. 